Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm your host, Deacon Jonathan Stord, joined by my co-host, Bishop Laney Peterson. Hello, Bishop. Hello, Deacon. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good for life in the Kenoma. It's uh, it's summer. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time outdoors. Going to be doing some some more like camping, beachy stuff. Uh, you know, the, I don't know. The, the, these are meant to live forever. Particularly tonight's show, right? A lot of our shows aren't very timely. So I know I talk about this a lot in the intros. I never know if someone's going to be listening to this. For all I know, I, I've already died in a volcano explosion, right? Uh, yeah. So life is good, and I'm waiting for whatever horrible thing is going to drop next. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Well, yes. But it's also important to enjoy the good times because yes. we do know that something really awful is probably going to be happening shortly. Happen short. Yeah. And for the whole world hating dualism thing, that's what I've always thought of as well. Life is often uh, really awesome and enjoyable, even with uh, in the small ways. So, um, you know, I, I think we are partly here to experience the wonders of existence. So uh, enjoy it while you can. Uh, anyway, so this is not Jonathan Stewart's Depression Hour. Uh, <laughs> this is his diagnosis <laughs> and Bishop Laney. We have uh, we have very special guests tonight. Plural. It's it's you, the Gnostic elite, the the viewers and listeners who have given us your questions for our uh, uh, you monthly, more or less monthly, almost monthly Q and A shows, uh, where we do our best to uh, answer questions from you. Uh, about Gnosticism. We say do our best because I think our answers are pretty rad, but of course we are dealing <laughs> with often you folks drop us some really heavy stuff that cannot be, uh, that perhaps doesn't have answers or answers that could be understood by human beings. So please keep that in mind. Yes. Um, so let's just get right into it. Uh, a fun one from Earth Wind. Thank you, Earth Wind. Uh, who is one specific figure from a Gnostic or esoteric mythos, or one specific aspect or part of a Gnostic myth? Do you really like? Uh, mind if I start with that one, Bishop Laney? And, no, right and, and for that, if, if we're getting a little bit more uh, granular, if, if we're getting, uh, you know, if we're not looking at, at, at whole whole myths uh, in all the figures in them, I guess just Sophia, right? I, I really like that idea of, of wisdom and, and some of the metaphors that are contained within there, that, that wisdom isn't wisdom unless it, it first falls and has to have actual experiences right? right which is my interpretation of uh it's not just mine of, of of some of what the gnostics are getting to right and yeah. that that wisdom that's not tested isn't wisdom it's fake wisdom uh so as well as just you know we've talked about divine feminine figures and how perhaps sometimes those are overly em emphasized or confused in gnosticism or perhaps not emphasized enough or what have you depending on the topic and who we're talking about but it still appeals to me as 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 a good mainline Protestant boy who didn't really grow up with uh, any, even though I was in a church, I probably wasn't opposed to it, but didn't have a, a lot of divine feminine in it. Uh, that, that's why Sophia and the mythos associated with her, um, I, I think really appeals to me personally. And uh, <laughs> I won't start mine over, I'll just edit. So, um, so yeah, lady, what do you think? <laughs> What's one specific figure? Sorry, now I'm laughing. Okay, Sorry. okay. here we go. Uh, just let me get the time count here. Ten twenty. Okay. So, so yeah. So that's mine. Um, so Lainey, what? Who is one specific figure from a Gnostic or esoteric mythos? I like that they said esoteric mythos or a specific aspect or part of a of an esoteric or Gnostic myth that that you really like. Um, for me, actually, it's outside Gnosticism and Christianity. It's actually in the Norse uh, mythos. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the figure of Tyr, who was probably the preeminent sky god um, in an older version of Germanic polytheism or Germanic religion, um, who became allied with the Asir in the Norse mythos. And he was in a he was a very brave, bold warrior god. And at one point, the Asir found themselves in a pickle because Loki had sired these children, incredibly powerful children, one of which was a wolf. The Asir saw that this wolf could perhaps destroy everything around him, so they kidnapped Fenris' wolf and they gave him to Tyr to raise because Tyr was the only god who was brave enough to deal with the wolf. Um, but it eventually became obvious that this wolf was more than anybody could handle and they, the gods wanted to bind up the wolf and they attempted to do so several times 
And eventually they were able to get some bindings, but they needed to get the bindings on the wolf. Uh, Tyr promised the wolf that you know, this was not going to be permanent um, or that you know, the wolf would not be fully restrained. Uh, the wolf agreed to allow himself to be bound, but wanted a bond. And that was Tyr's hand, sword hand, mm -hmm. which he put in his, you know, Tyr put his hand in the jaws of the wolf, knowing full well that these, bound, these, these bindings were going to hold that wolf and that Tyr was going to lose his hand. And so there was a massive act of betrayal on the part of Tyr, but he was also attempting to essentially save civilization and the cosmos and, <laughs> and, and the rest of it. And, um, you know, hit the, after that, he was known as the leavings of the wolf uh, by the other gods. And you know, some some people have gone back and forth about this. You know, was Tyr noble in what he did, or did he, you know, what did he do to this child? You know, that he had raised, and he had betrayed this child terribly. Um, and it, it's an interesting question, and for me, it represents what it is to be incarnate. That you find yourself up against forces and circumstances over which you have no control. And as John Michael Greer says, you end up with predicaments, not problems, because problems can often be solved. In some cases, though, you have a predicament. That's a situation that you have to adapt to. And for me, um, to hear that willingness on his part to yeah. do what was necessary in a situation, even though it would be smirch his good name, because dishonor, particularly among the Norse, was a horrific, totally horrific thing. It, you know, the, your honor, he was very much an honor bound culture. And so what he did was dishonorable, but it was done as a way of saving the Asir, the Vanir, the, and the nine worlds. Um, so that to me is a very powerful story and a reminder of doing what is right, even when um, I may be harming others or myself in the process and having to live with what others might think of me. Yeah, and and I find that to be also a, the, not just an esoteric, but very, very Gnostic story. And and of course, you know, we there are dangers as modern Gnostics that, that we cherry pick or we take aspects of, of myths um, and cultures uh, without fully understanding and, you know, cramming it into a Gnostic narrative. But if the ancient Mediterranean Gnostics ran into the Norse, then <laughs> then they would have borrowed their gods and interpreted them uh, in a Gnostic uh, fashion. But that's, I, I, I agree with you. I, I think that's a very powerful uh, story with uh, some very uh, powerful and uh, important spiritual lessons. Well, the, 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 and I would point out that the Romans did, and they associated yeah. um, Tyr with I, 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 uh, Mars. Um, yeah. So, you know, they, he, they actually absolutely did that with them. And it's, uh, it's kind of fascinating on its own and how of these, these gods have trickled into our culture, um, despite the fact that Christianity was triumphant. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, okay, uh, next question from Tom Yum Soup. I think you've briefly mentioned this on the show and said you basically don't know, but I've been curious lately about how to introduce Gnostic concepts to my children. Do we just go mainline Protestant and then when they're in their teens, I blow their minds? Lol. Uh, mind if I start with that one uh, sure. again, Bishop? Sure. Just uh, my, my wife and I are, are thinking about uh, having kids. Uh, we'll keep you as updated. Maybe we won't. But um, so it's it's something that's definitely on my mind. And we're also an interfaith family. But yeah, I think that is just that. I think you can, you know, Gnosticism is life. It's living, right? We mm -hmm. can't put things into very specific small boxes, um, which is not how the ancients did it. And it's, it's a very modern peccadillo, right? Right. Uh, so, so yes and no. So I, I think there's ways to introduce NASA concepts and live NASA concepts with your children. But it, it, if you're looking at sort of the example of the Valentinians and the example of some of the early Gnostics, they, they really are coming along to fully grown adults who already know the, mm -hmm. the, the mythos of the religion that they're in, be that of ancient Egypt, uh, 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 early Judaism or Christianity, right? And then you say, well, you know what? Here's the extra interpretation. Here's what this myth really means, or here's what you haven't been told about the Garden of Eden story. So that is tricky where, where what it seems like in ancient Gnosticism 
and it really seems to be a religion for adults, and it really seems like you need to have a background first. So I, I guess, uh, and of course, you know, I always go way back, to, right back to the ancient Gnostics. But if we're going to talk about modern Gnostics, modern esotericists, very much so, right? If you look at the Gnostics of the 1800s and the early 20th century, you know, they're uh, they're probably not raising their their children Gnostic for the most part. It's really viewed as a religion for adults. Um, but that said, I, I think that, uh, yeah, the, my advice might be if, if you're looking for a community and, and child-friendly community, then maybe going to an Episcopal church or mainline Protestant church or a place that you're comfortable so you can have those aspects and your children can have community and exposure to um, uh, the, the mythos and uh, good solid religion. And then you can kind of talk to them later, right? And, and deepen that and see if they're interested in it. So, I mean, you're talking to a childless, you know, almost 40 year old man with, with a 15 pound cat. So I might be the wrong person, but I think that's what I'm going to try to do. But that said, it's not that you can, that you have to completely cut it off, right? Because there are aspects of Gnosticism, aspects of esoteric religion, aspects of mysticism that I think work really well with kids. I find a lot of Gnosticism is Sunday school questions, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's the same thing that I asked when I was nine in Sunday school. <laughs> you know, why do you put the tree there if you knew you were going to eat, if they knew they were going to eat from it, right? Um, the, the questions like that. So so that's that's my take on it. Take it over a grain of salt. I can ask my cat for her feedback. Uh, Bishop Laney, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think you touched on some really key issues here. And one of the issues is that Gnosticism uh, I think as you know, it has been there's a kind of a reconstructed Gnosticism that we have now, but it was not a living tradition for a long time. And there might have been some strains of Gnostic thought in various religious movements over time, but it's not been this cohesive movement, certainly not institutionalized. It's not been an institution. And um, you know, the Christian formation of children is highly institutionalized. It, it's you have the whole Sunday school movement. You had children who would memorize scripture uh, at home and in school. You've got uh, songs that have been developed, you know, for children. There are prayers that have been developed for children. You've got Bible study books. You have people with doctorates in Christian education who specialize in figuring out ways to teach children uh, the Christian faith. And that's not something you're gonna have in modern Gnosticism. So um, I, I understand the, the feeling of helplessness here because there really isn't, as far as I can tell, um, a way that's analogous to the way uh, Christian children or Muslim children or Jewish children are being formed in their faith. Um, I do think, I mean, I do agree with you that going to the church of your choice and enrolling the child into the, the Sunday school or Christian education program uh, probably is, is, is good and a good an approach as any. Uh, the child who's learning scripture, who is learning theological concepts, who is learning, who is developing that vocabulary uh, will be in a good position to understand more advanced concepts. I mean, one point I would also make about Gnosticism, it was, was supposed to be about people who had a certain elite private secret knowledge. Yeah. Um, and usually that would suggest advanced concepts that require a certain foundation. So I, I would say that again, you know, the Gnosticism as such may not be a religion for children, but you can certainly answer questions, as you pointed out. Uh, you can certainly answer a, a child's questions. I would probably avoid some of those particularly <laughs> horrific stories about, you know, if archons raping women and, and women hiding in trees and that sort of thing. But I think that could be very distressing to a child, although I think that it's an important story uh, because it does point to the, the horrors that some children do experience. And maybe a teenager... Uh, who has experienced sexual abuse might find something in that story. So I think that that's something to consider. You might also want to consider um, uh, pop culture, movies, uh, The Matrix. A lot of teenagers, you know, enjoy The Matrix uh, and that trilogy. They you know, so there there are some things there that might be open, you know, open doors for yeah. teenagers. 
And well, I think younger, it's great. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah. For younger children, just to start getting them prepped, there's also the, uh, lots of great children's entertainment that could have a Gnostic interpretation. So Pinocchio being a, a big one. Uh, yeah. Another one, Velveteen Rabbit. That's why I'm a Gnostic. I read Velveteen Rabbit when I was a little yeah. kid. So, so yeah, so get them stuff like that. And then as, uh, as Lainey said, get them onto the good stuff when they're a teen. And then you can have the talk. It's not yeah. the birds and the bees. The talk. The, yeah. <laughs> Well, 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 son, well, child. It's the child. serpent and the tree. Ooh. Yeah, that's uh. right. It's, that's right. It's not the bird and the bees. It's the serpent and the trees. <laughs> um, and and I think we're thinking of maybe joining the local Unitarians um, more for that sort of like community and child religious education. Because, of course, you know, uh, the Unitarians do have uh, child religious uh, Sunday yeah. school or whatever yeah. they may call it, which gives them exposure to a variety of different religions. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah. So excellent question. Uh, and we hope that that uh, helps you, Tom Yum Soup. Uh, please get back to us. I, I guess this is sort of let us know how your child rearing goes. Check in. 15, 20 years, and uh, tell us how that turned out. Uh, Bishop Laney, can one be part of an Orthodox or quote unquote official Christian denomination and still also identify as a Gnostic or at least have theological influence from it? And that's from Smooth 81. What do you think, Bishop? Well, I think, first of all, that I mean, I, I, I believe that adherence or participation in a church always ought to demand more of the individual and the individual demands of the institution. Now, that is not a popular approach <laughs> these days. Uh, the idea is, is that institutions are supposed to accommodate any and all whims uh, of the individuals who come to the church. Um, and this can, to the, to the point where the individuals coming to the church feel that they need, that they can dictate a church's practices and beliefs. Now, I believe that that's the opposite, that a religion, a true religion that brings you in is there to form the individual, not the other way around. So what I would say is, is that if you have, you consider yourself to be a Gnostic or have Gnostic leanings and you are going to a church, I think that you should respect what that church is telling you. The church gets to decide uh, whether you are in or out. And you can make your own decision about how you choose to believe or how you choose to practice. But I think at some point you have to acknowledge that you don't get to tell the church how it ought to be. and You don't get to command the church to take you in. So if you're going to a church that has, you know, this incredible, it's, it's creedal, that has a, I believe, I believe, I believe, and that has canons that restrict certain beliefs and practices, you know, there you may very well be welcome to attend services there, but you might not be welcome to take communion. You may not be have the sacraments that are open to you in that case. Um, if you and so like Roman Catholic churches, Eastern Orthodox churches, big O Orthodox, uh, some uh, you know, Anglican churches. Um, some of the continuing Anglican, Anglican movements, for example, might all have very strict creeds and understanding of the sacraments, and so your participation would be very limited. Uh, and if you if you have integrity, you will accept those limitations. That is my view on that topic. Now, there are mainline Protestant churches. Uh, there are churches like the Unitarians, uh, where you know they are not creedal; that you are not expected to adhere to a set of beliefs. There may be some affirmations that the church may have, but you're not, you know, you're not required to affirm creedal compliance. And I think in that case, I mean, unless the church tells you otherwise because of the way the congregation operates, I think you can participate fully in those churches um, and, and, and continue your search and your journey in those places. I just think that it's important to have integrity in the process. Yeah. And 
we have, and I know some people are, are live in very small areas and they don't mm -hmm. have many options and uh, options, particularly for, for Christian flavor churches can shrink year by year. Um, mm -hmm. But but I would say much the same. If you're going to go that route too, you're, you're also just going to have a better time outside of sort of the ethical and moral stuff that, that I think you're talking about, Bishop. I, I think you're if you're in a denomination or a church that is, you know, very anti-Gnostic, if you're internally a Gnostic, you're, you're just not doing yourself any favors, right? Right, right. Um, and but that's just it. A, a lot of the mainline, very liberal denominations would probably love to have you. You know, I can't speak on behalf of them, obviously, but yeah. I know if you're a Unitarian, probably United Church of Christ, probably some Episcopal churches, so that could vary. Probably some others, right? So I, I would definitely seek out a, a place that would love to have you, where you could be comfortable being a uh, that being a Gnostic, and it's it's it, you'll just have a better time. Um, you know, that that said, you, there is sort of a long tradition getting, depending on how you sort of define Gnostic, where you can, if you feel a real pull for a particular denomination, you, you know, there, there are some of the, the esoteric trainings and orders where a lot of people would keep going to mainline denominations, mm -hmm. right? And then they would go to mass, and yeah. those things were really segregated and segmented, right? So, right. you know, you would go do, uh, pro probably uh, Martinism would be one of the best examples, which can get very Gnostic-y. Right. Um, and a lot of the, the, a lot of people involved in Martinism are involved in uh, Gnostic churches, but there's a long history of them being involved with uh, even even schisms over uh, Martinists not wanting to leave the Catholic Church. Now, right. you, you you may not want to talk to certain people within the Catholic Church about Martinism or, or what have you, but uh, so, so I, I don't know where I'm going with that, except that there is sort of a history of it, of, of some of these, these sort of gnostic -y side movements. Um, sure. So that, that is there. And that is sort of, of course, different than, you know, a lot of these movements say that they're not religions, right? Um, so so perhaps, perhaps that is different. But yeah, to make a long story short, um, I would say look for a Gnostic church, and if you can't find one, uh, go to a place where, where you're going to be happy to be there, and they're going to be happy to have you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And again, I, and I want to remind people that even Roman Catholic churches, for example, that ha have lists of organizations that you cannot belong to and be right. a Catholic, uh, they still welcome you to attend services. Yeah. You are you are most welcome in the yeah. in the in the in those services. And, um, I, you know, I think that that may if that's what you feel a pull to you may have something else that you need to start working out. And one good way of doing that is by attending the services and participating to the extent that the church permits you to do so. Yeah, yeah, 100 percent. I, I concur. Um, OK, next. This is from Thursday again. Uh, does Gnosticism literally deny the material world in that the physical world does not actually exist? What do you think, Bishop? You know, I have never met a Gnostic who starved themselves to death. I have never <laughs> met a Gnostic who has died due to dehydration. I have never met a Gnostic, and it, actually when it comes right down to it, who does not have some means of support. Yeah. Um, so I would say that, uh, I would say that most Gnostics at least do not live as though the material world doesn't exist. Um, and I think that we recognize, I mean, I know I myself, I recognize that it exists. I get out of bed every morning. Law of gravity keeps me in that bed until I swing my legs out and put my feet on the floor. Um, so I, yeah, this, this is how I live my life. This is what I know. And this is how I operate. As I said earlier, though, I think that the material world, the physical world, the world that we are currently uh abiding in right now has its limitations and its forces that are beyond our control. And that can be a very uncomfortable place to be. And for, uh, for many people, for many of us who are Gnostics, we try to use these conditions as a way of, of further refinement, as you were talking about earlier with wisdom. Yeah. You know, wisdom requires that descent into that which is heavier and more dense and more damaging so that ascension can eventually be possible. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I don't think that's what the ancient Gnostics were getting at, that the world is literally an illusion. I, I don't know too many modern Gnostics who, who believe it in a very literal sense. And as far as I know, same thing with many other religions where, where this is thought, that, that, that reality is an illusion. Apparently, many Buddhist writers, and of course, there's differences within Buddhism and within the different songhas and traditions, but they also say, you know, this this is more of, of a metaphor. Like, materiality uh, is is a pale copy in the Gnostic mythos of, of a reality that is that is original and perfect and perhaps you could think of it as more real but you know just because this is a copy um and it's a little less real and it will not exist forever unlike everything um in the pleroma i and i think you know obviously the gnostics the ancient gnostics didn't have television movies or uh, uh, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Lasers, holograms. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, they, they do, you know, they, they did have plays and shadows and hallucinations. And, you know, they, they did know that there's all sorts of different metaphors and understandings that one can have about reality. Um, so I, I think when they're talking about the world being illusionary or where there's references to being illusionary it really is meant on, on a metaphorical way um but again getting into that word literal we're running into all sorts of problems yeah <laughs> you know i would I'm also not, yeah, sorry. yeah oh sorry go ahead i was just gonna say that i think there's also that matter of perception that um we have cognitive biases yeah and there are there are our neurology we had a wall with our neurology you know, we only have so many cones in our eyes when it comes to seeing colors. Yep. And there are apparently some creatures, I think there's some sea creatures that are seeing color, seeing stuff on the color spectrum that we cannot even imagine. Yeah. And I, again, you know, there, there are whole websites dedicated to cognitive biases and why we continue to believe something contrary to all evidence. Um you know, where, where, why we think the way we do, how we react the way we do. Um, all of these things, I think, uh, are, are, those are the things that, that can, we are possibly dealing with on a spiritual level. It, it's not so much that gravity uh, doesn't exist, but it's how we perhaps limit ourselves and find ourselves stuck, metaphorically stuck, because the way our, our neurology interacts with the physical world right it's it's less the matrix and more the secret life of walter mitty um it's uh when we're looking at some of the disillusionary stuff same thing with again what a lot of the buddhists say and i, I would say a lot of most, modern gnostics say you know what's illusionary is is actually your perception of the world right due to some of the issues that you're talking about as well as the, the way that the brain is constructed by uh society right uh, i should say mm -hmm. the mind sorry the, the self mind the mind not the brain but as well as well as the, as the, well as the, the brain yes as well as the brain well the brain is shaped by by society that's it, true it, it, it is plastic yep. and and, it is it, plastic. Yep. and you know what happened with evolution how did you know humans are born with these big brains which is why we're born so immature yeah because a physical a, a woman cannot carry a three-year pregnancy or yeah. two-year pregnancy um and so they're they're you know the Humanity has been shaped, our spirits, our souls, our minds, but also our physical bodies have, have been shaped. And they, they are they they work together. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so I would say, you know, if you're looking for something that is that is sort of more illusionary that's in the material world, but is in the material world, can be our, our outlooks and our perspectives, right? And when we really dive into some of those, our worldviews, as well as our ideas about who and what we are, right? Those are quite illusionary. Um, the floor beneath me may not be, but the concept of floor and what I think about floors and the word floor, all of that reality might be much more in flux. And I think that's what some of the Gnostics, as well as just some of the great mystics in general, are mm -hmm. getting to when they're talking about some of the unreality of this realm. Um, and, and of course, uh, the, uh, for anybody who has had spiritual experiences, right, mm -hmm. it, this, this stuff does seem to sort of 
fall away, the, the perceptual stuff. And you do seem to be touching something that, that this is the experience and we're trying to put it into words, something that seems much more real. Uh, you know, that is a very common, um, I think, description when people are trying to describe what it is that they experience or what happened to them, right? Sure. Because words words can be a, a loss whenever you are talking about these, these peak experiences, mystical experiences, mm -hmm. insights, or even if you're not like flying through the heavens, ascending for the seven planets, just in some of the experiences that you can have, you know, doing doing meditative work, contemplative work, where suddenly it feels like you're brushing up against something that's more real. Um, and I can't say much more than that because again, I, I don't really have the, the vocabulary for it. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, why was the Gospel of Thomas not included in the Bible? That's from Danny Santos. I'll start with that. Well, Danny, of course we will never know. It's an unanswerable question unless we get a time machine. Um, but uh, we do know the Gospel of Thomas seems to be pretty early. Uh, it, it could be a first century text. If it's not a first century text, it does seem to be um, early, close to at least contemporary with some of the, the other Gospels, at least John, uh, if not all four of them, who knows. Um, and, and why it wasn't included? Well, there is an overemphasis on um later developments in in christian history by the time you get to the fourth century the 300s when constantine becomes emperor and then converts to christianity um or favors christianity however you want to phrase it there's sort of an over exaggeration that he really made the bible the bible and it really was sort of a, a roman orthodox uh conspiracy but even by the time constantine rolls around the uh, he doesn't make christianity the state religion uh it's growing but it's still not uh, not the power it is and the the first um uh, conferences that, that that the early church had at least the very first is, is not about biblical canon as much as it is about uh heresies about the nature of christ right mm -hmm. so just just to sorry to go on the ramble but to clear some of that up because a lot of people or people in the comments are going to be like it's because constantine kicked it out in sometime in the in the 300s um but but the quick the quick answer is 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 that um the the groups, and the, I'll say groups of an S actually, the groups that became the Orthodox Church, early Christianity is very diverse, there's a bunch of, a bunch of groups. One of the ways that the Orthodox becomes the biggest is that they actually combine um, different texts and beliefs from all these groups. So it's less persecution than, than, than building a, a Voltron or playing with Lego, right? The, the, the persecutions, even though we have heresy hunters in the, in the first century, they don't have a lot of power with, with that heresy. Of course, they can kick people out of their bigger churches but they don't have a lot of power with their heresy hunting yet. Um, so, so the Orthodox uh, Church is putting all these things uh, together and uh, they're just winning the popularity contest. And they picked up that the Gospel of Thomas, even though it does seem to be early, the theology in it is not the theology of, of their community. So it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't get copied. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, remember, everything had to be done by hand by a very small select group of people, uh, some of the few who could read and write. And it was uh, a lot of labor and books were really expensive to to manufacture. Yeah. So, um, so so I think a lot of people, would, would, you know, maybe the answer they're looking for or hoping for is perhaps a little bit more conspiratorial. But it, in the case of the Gospel of Thomas, probably you know, losing, losing that popularity contest um, and, and not coming into the canon. And it did take a while for the biblical canon to, to be put together, right? Even with the, the sort of proto-Orthodox rolling around in the, in the second century. Um, we, we know, you know, relatively early that the four gospels seem to be adopted by some of the bigger names in, in Christianity because they're quoting from it, right? The church fathers, the church mothers. Uh, we have, um, you know, they talk about heresy hunters, people writing about heresy. You know, we have uh, Irenaeus at, at the end of the first century who um, who gave us, sorry, at the end of the second century, gave us a lot of information about the Gnostics, doesn't like them, but he, he you know, he writes this is an example of the logic at the time, but he says, well, you know, there's four directions, there's four winds, there's uh, four angels around the throne of God. That means there can only be four gospels. Right. Now, this, this is meant to be, this is an argument that would have made sense to him and his readers that would actually would have followed Greek logic just fine, I'm sure. But now that doesn't seem like a very logical argument to us. So see, we have ideas about canon and what belongs and what doesn't. And it actually does seem that that it's, you know, uh, um, uh, 
a heretic, what, what we now call a heretic, but um, uh, Marcion, who's not a Gnostic, but who has some similarities to, to Gnosticism, and we did a show on him that I can link up, he actually seems to be the first to put together a canon, saying that these are the, these are the Christian books of the church. You know, it's my church, but, you know, whenever you're in a Christian church, uh, particularly them, but even now it's the church, <laughs> my church, the church, and these books are not. And that actually inspired the, the neo-Orthodox, sorry, the, uh, the proto-Orthodox and some of the other groups to start putting together canons, right? And once you put together a canon, what goes in, what doesn't. Uh, so yeah, so that's my long answer for that. Uh, Bishop, do you, do you have anything for um, uh, why was the Gospel of Thomas not included in the Bible? I think, you know, you covered it extremely well. The only thing that I would say is that of all of the, shall we say, apocryphal um, books, uh, Gnostic or otherwise, the Gospel of Thomas has, I think, received the most serious scholarly attention yeah. over the past several decades. I know the Jesus Seminar, uh, you know, they, they worked with, with its sayings and determining what was legit and what wasn't. I know that I've seen, like, a... Uh, uh, Gospels that you know the, the comparison gospels where they're where, where they're put together. There's a name for it. I forget what it is off the top of my head, but they've included the Gospel of Thomas in those books. The Gospel of Thomas, I think, has been taken very seriously, far more seriously, uh, by scholars uh, within the the Christian theological tradition uh, than other than, than the other books, uh, yeah. other so-called Gnostic gospels or Gnostic books. So. Um, I would say that, in, that while it may have been left out at the beginning, it has certainly received its due in recent years. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And and I think that that's a pretty relevant question, or perhaps why why it was asked too, is that it, of course the Gospel of Thomas something like seventy five percent of it shares material with the other Gospels, right? So that mm -hmm. does make you know perhaps a little bit more. And of course, it's it, I do believe it to be a Gnostic text. That that's a that's a description. That's a talk for another time. But that said, you know, a lot of these sayings are, are really lead themselves to interpretation, right? So I, I could did, actually. Yeah. I could see it having been slid in there because you can really, you know, lead the the, the interpretations, and you know that there is some some arguments from like April DeConnick that the Gospel of John is is Gnostic, but you have to have like the um, the hermeneutic key for seeing that, and, and of course Paul is proto Gnostic, and there's lots of Gnostic elements in the in the New Testament and in the Old Testament and in the Bible. So I, I could see it sneaking in because it does share that much material with the other Gospels. And, yeah. you know, you could have a priest or another interpreter come along and say, you know, the Gnostics say that this this passage means this, but actually it means this very orthodox thing. But, uh, but uh, it didn't make the cut, and it is too bad. Um, but uh, uh, we have it now. And as Bishop Laney uh, was saying, it's, it's being taken uh, very seriously. So. Well, the other thing I would say is that the book, as I seem to recall, and it's been a while since I've been going over the top the possible of Thomas, but what I remember was it pointed away from Peter and toward James the Just yeah. uh, as the leader of the church. And my guess is that's stuck in certain people's cross. Yes, yeah, that would be a very, a very good example, and I mean, that, I think that's one of the opening uh, passages too. So, yeah, so yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, next, uh, uh, who are some of your recent living spiritual inspirations? And that's from Alligator Alligator, uh, Bishop Laney. Wow, um, you know, I haven't had a, a huge number. Yeah. Of spiritual inspirations, they just just personally, um, as as everybody privately knows that you know, in terms of 20th century spiritual figure figures, Gurdjieff has probably had the most impact on me in his 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 teachings. Um, I think that um, I think there's been a real decline in institutions, faith people have in institutions. We've particularly seen it. Over the past year, with the global health crisis, the in many cases the lack of trust that people have in inst health institutions and in journalism, but we've, we're also seeing it with religion um, that people are just simply not trusting religious institutions or figures. That I think in many ways there's an assumption that if somebody puts themselves out there as a religious leader, uh, there's something fishy going on. And in some cases, we've been finding out that this suspicion is warranted. Yeah. So I guess I, I you know, I personally just, you know, I, I, I connect with human beings, but not necessarily so-called 
uh, leaders or teachers. And I have a feeling, just a suspicion, that we're going to be moving into an age that's going to take a while, um, but that we're probably not going to be seeing as many so-called religious celebrities um, as much as we are just going to see people just taking what knowledge they can from different sources, putting it together, and when possible, joining others in community. Yeah. Yeah, I agree that that, that that's the future, and, you know, we're seeing that that trend now. Um, I, I have a couple. Uh, I like Tara Brock. She's a, she's a Buddhist um, a meditation uh, uh, teacher, uh, but she is, uh, I believe she lived on an ashram, and it was uh, originally connected more to Hinduism and yoga, and she is also a great lover of the Sufis and the mystical Christian tradition, and I think she might have a Jewish background, so she really does bring in uh, and, and she's a, a practicing psychologist, practice and trained psychologist. So she, she really brings all of these aspects into her teaching in a very not flaky way that makes uh, everything work really well. So, so she's one of my faves. And uh, for living, uh, well, Alan Moore, who, who's come up on the show quite a bit, uh, if we're going to talk about somebody who's, you know, kind of a Gnostic and esoteric, uh, esotericist, uh, I like his writings on esoterica, even though it's not that much, but I admire him as an artist. I really like his, his work and his novels. I also admire how, you know, famously Alan Moore, uh, the Hollywood has, uh, he doesn't own the rights to some of his most famous comic books, um, but he is still, re, uh, uh, um, you know, he still has agreements for, for massive royalties from them, and he refuses, you know, what are very large sums of money, um, and he just says, uh, give it to the artist, because he, he doesn't feel that um, he wants to profit from an adaptation of his work, because it is no longer his work anymore, uh, and he feels he doesn't want his name associated with it, and he doesn't want their money. Um, so, a lot of times when, and that is the deal, actually, uh, a lot of times if you watch a movie based on an Alan Moore work, uh, his name won't be in the credits because he said, take my name off and keep your million bucks or whatever. And I, I don't know if I could or could do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't so, know either. I don't yeah. either. That's admirable. Yeah. So, so if we're talking about inspiration uh, and, you know, so maybe not someone that someone thinks of as a spiritual teacher, but he is involved with modern esoterica. Um, and uh, uh, Richard Rohr, uh, Father Richard Rohr, I, I like him quite a bit if you're looking for sort of an inspirational uh, living teacher. He's a Franciscan um, uh, the priest, um, a contemplative, and uh, I highly recommend his works. Uh, you know, he's he's a big fan of Jung. He's a big fan of the Christian mystical tradition. Uh, he works in everything quite well. Uh, he works quite closely with uh, Cynthia Borjo. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure perhaps, I, I don't think he'd be appalled. I'm sure he'd be fine, you know, at least being called small G Gnostic. He wouldn't like being called big G Gnostic, but that might get him in trouble in his community. And I think if people read his books, um, uh, if you are a Gnostic or you're you're really into a lot of modern Gnostic practices and beliefs and, and such, a lot will seem quite familiar. And uh, I wonder how much behind the scenes he's he's on the tight tightrope of getting in trouble. But Catholicism is uh, there's almost a billion of them. It can be a very it's a very strange large organization, and and sometimes some 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 pretty powerful um, uh, teachers can be can be found there. Uh, I guess I mentioned Cynthia. I better stick Cynthia in there as well. Also a teacher of uh, of the fourth way. Uh, she incorporates. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, because uh, uh, Fourth Way teachings uh, as well, uh, in which I, I think is really neat because she's also involved in mainline Episcopalianism she as is. well as yeah. Cynthia Borchow, uh, yeah, she's fantastic. Yeah, so I think I think that would be that would be my list, and it might actually be a good thing. You know, we don't have much. I mean, you know, modern Gnostic modern modern Gnosticism is not that not that big, right? So we don't really have some of the the superstars that that you might see in the definitely not in the new age movement or even buddhism or hinduism or contemplative movements right and, and that might be for the best i, I better give uh, i better say every clergy member in my church um because you know they're going to be watching this particularly so all, mar thomas yes yes exactly so they he's my inspiration they're all my inspiration um <laughs> actually all, uh, but all jokes aside you know they, they must inspire me in some way or i wouldn't be where i am right um, so, uh, and finally, I guess just for inspiration, turns out I have a lot of living inspirations. I thought I was going to have almost none, but, but I think, uh, well, I guess he's dead now, but even Manly P. Hall and, uh, and Bishop Heller, just like doing modern esotericism for like 50, 60 years yep. <laughs> until their last breath and, uh, and, and Heller yeah. is still alive and more alive than I am. Like, I mean, he, like, no, he yeah, I and, mean, like, what he has done and what he has, what that man has put up with. Yes. Um, you know, I, I, I do tend to have respect for those who put up with 
stuff for a long period of time and do it with grace. Yes. Yeah. So, so I guess if we're just, you know, ad admirable at the, at the very most. So, um, okay. So we are at, uh, uh, wrap up time. Uh, I forgot to do the, the plugs, uh, give us money. We need it. Or we can't do the show about it. Yeah. <laughs> There's the last one. Patreon.com slash Gnostic, uh, paypal.com slash Gnostic for one-time donations. If you go to the Patreon, then, uh, as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. Uh, Bishop, uh, the big news, uh, uh, Father Tony, who's had very weird work schedules and, and very weird life stuff going on for years now uh, he does have a, a, a gig at least for the next year where his schedule is a little bit more open so uh, our loyal fans and uh listeners and viewers may have noticed that he's been he's he's been resurrected uh he lives uh, so he lives he lives yes he is risen so um uh, we're hoping to do even more of father tony but uh but watch all our social media and stuff because um he's doing uh, uh for the last couple months he's going to make it a monthly thing monthly movie watches of, of gnostic movies online so people can mm -hmm. just get together online with him and uh do that um and uh he is streaming i uh right now it's monday nights but just go to twitch.tv slash gnostic wisdom he's uh streaming video games that have Gnostic themes and talking about Gnosticism, so you can join in on, on them there. And something else that's super cool is uh, we're going to start um, premiering the show, so setting uh, setting it up as a premiere on YouTube, so the, the pre-recorded shows right now are secret, right? The, 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 the people off the streets, they can't get access to them until I release them, but we can set them up as premieres, and um, we're going to start premiering them on Sunday nights at 8, uh, and uh, you can watch them live with Father Tony. Uh, so he's going to watch the show, you can watch it with him, and you, you folks can talk about it. And that will be through Twitch as well, Twitch TV slash Gnostic Wisdom. I realize that, of course, lots of people listen to this as a podcast, and I was just throwing it up on the screen. So that's twitch.tv slash Gnostic Wisdom. <laughs> Um, anyways, give us money so we can keep doing all of all of this programming. Um, uh, the father is is hoping to do lots of these. This is all live as well. Hoping to do lots of, of weekly live events. And I, I guess I already mentioned too that that would be every week, right? So yeah. so the, a lot of fun there. Um, uh, Bishop, do you have any plugs before we before we go? Uh, not at this time, but I hope to soon. Okay, fantastic. Well, hey, looking forward. Okay, that, okay. this is good. You're getting everybody riled up, getting excited. They're gonna be they're gonna be pumped for that next episode to find out what the, the mysteries of Bishop Laney. Yeah. Uh, as <laughs> always, thanks thanks so much for the questions, everybody. They were really awesome questions, and uh, you can have, you you don't have to wait for us to announce these shows when I'm trolling for questions. You can leave your questions in the comments below. You can send them in to us on social media or or through my email, which is also uh, below. Okay. Thanks so much, everybody, and Bishop. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye.